Amen. Thank you. Please go ahead and be seated. Man, what a sweet time of praise and worship that was. Amen. It's good to see all of you here today. I uh, remind you now that it is time for our children's church. So kindergarten, first and second graders, you may be dismissed. Miss Carrie is back there in the back waiting on you. So uh, if you'll meet with her back there and then we'll see you all uh, at the end of our service today. Man, it's good to have you all here. It was a great time. I hope everyone at home and watching on our live stream was able to sense the, the sweetness that we have here and that you were singing along with us and praising the Lord together. Amen. Well, today I'm going to wrap up the series of messages entitled uh, Making the Church the Place to Be. We're going to close off today with the idea and the thought of how we do that. How do we make this the place to be? And quite frankly, it's when we serve with passion. When the world outside sees the church serving God with a, with a passion in our heart. When they see us giving and when they see us worshiping, when they see us reaching them for Jesus with all that we have with great passion, then my friends, this will be the place to be. I want you to take your Bibles and turn to Colossians chapter 3, starting at verse 23. We'll read two verses in our text, 23 and 24. Today, we're going to again be wrapping up the idea of making church the place to be by looking at a text of, of where Paul is writing to the church. And he's at this point, he's talking about husbands and wives and families and us giving ourselves over to uh, those who are, have authority over us. And then he gives us this text that I believe that if we will follow this, it will transform the ministries of our church. It will transform the ministry that we have of reaching people for Jesus. Let's go ahead and stand in honor of reading God's word. Colossians chapter 3, verses 23 and 24. And Paul writes here, he says, And whatever you do, do it heartily, or do it with all your heart, as to the Lord and not to men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Father, we come to you now. We thank you for the great time of praise and worship we just experienced. And now, God, as I, I step into this time of sharing your word, I pray, Father, that, that everything that I say, that, God, these will not be my words, but these will be yours. I pray, God, that this message will not be my message, but yours as well. And, Father, I pray that you will speak to the hearts of, of men and women, boys and girls, here and, and those watching us on our live stream, and that, Father, they would respond to you as you desire for them to respond. And, Father, it is in the name of Jesus I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Go ahead and be seated. Today what I want to look at again is serving with the passion. A good friend of mine that I was visiting with this week, a good pastor friend, he, he shared this thought with me, and, and, and it really shook me for a second. It says, and what, what he said was, this is the first national emergency, this COVID outbreak, that anyone in our time has ever lived through that didn't cause people to seek the church, but rather caused them to abandon the church and even close it down. And I began to think about that. That all the times when we have had other national emergencies, man, when we had uh, other things go on, when we had uh, September 11th, when we had all these other things going on, man, people were flocking to the church. They were trying to find a place to go in the church, and attendance of the church went up. And he, he began to think about and he, he shared this with me as we were talking about the, the affairs of the church and the state of the church. And he said this to me, and folks, listen, it really shook me for a second. I hadn't really put it in that perspective. That right now, in this day and time, more people are trying to find reasons not to be in the church than they are to be in the church. This has never happened in my lifetime or your lifetime. And so my question is, how are we going to make this the place to be? How are we going to get that back? And I began to think this as, as, as I was looking at my over my notes for the final message of this series. The church will be the place to be when not only we do the ministries right, as I preached last week, that not only we do the ministries right, but we do them with passion. Folks, I believe that's something that's severely missing from the church today. And I'm not talking about just First Baptist. I'm talking about the church in America. This passion for what God has called us to do. And we're going to make the church the place to be when we do that. So my question is, well, how do we know? 
As God began to work on my heart on this message weeks ago, I asked the question, because I can fool myself, amen? I, I You know, and I want to relate to it again here later on, but I used to coach girls basketball for 17 years before I became a pastor. And one of the things that I would always do is I would always be on the girls about giving everything, giving everything. And I could, even at times I'd say, Coach, we're giving everything we got. But I knew that they weren't. I knew they were going through the motions. Or I used to call it, they were dogging me. They really weren't pushing. I could tell that. But in their mind, they had convinced themselves that they were giving everything they had. And my friends, I think sometimes that we can do that even in our own lives, personal lives, but in the life of the church, I think we can sit back and say, man, we are giving everything we have. How then, if we, to not fool ourselves, but how then can we know that we're serving with a passion? How can we know that we're doing everything with all of our hearts? And there's three things that I came up with that I want to share with you very quickly. The first one is the idea that when we know that we're serving and doing everything with our with with uh, with a great passion when our heart is at the center of it when our heart is the center of everything that that everything that we do it says do it with all of your heart now we know the heart is the idea of of the center of our being it's the, the center of our existence that if everything i'm doing i'm doing it with all of my heart now listen you know people that do things with a passion amen it's pretty easy to feel and find out what people are passionate about You can watch them. You can see how they dress. You can see where they go. You can see what they do. You can see what they spend their money on. And that is an idea of they're doing it with passion. And so this is what we're looking at is when the heart is at the center. And and what we have to do is we need to understand that it's not the head. We sometimes can get so wrapped up in the intellectual thoughts that, that it's our intellect, it's our reasoning, and we try to lay things out there the way we understand it. But my friends, let me tell you something. I've come to realize I don't know everything. Amen? I can fool myself at times. I can think I am all that, and I think I know all the answers. Have you ever thought you knew something, then you found out you didn't? Have you ever gotten involved in something, you thought you had it all figured out, and then you got in the middle of it, and you realized you didn't have it figured out? I call that having a good idea that turns stupid about halfway through it. Amen? We've all been there, don't we? We use our intellect and we begin to think of how we can do it and we figure it all out and we lay it out there for ourselves. It's our understanding and our reasoning. My friends, can I tell you that for a church and for a life, for a Christian, that's a dangerous place to be is trying to do everything by our intellect because, listen, we don't know it all. But can I tell you something, some good news today? We know somebody that does. We have a God. We have a Savior who knows all of it. We don't know, as Patrick even said, we don't know what tomorrow is bringing with this stuff. But can I tell you, God does. And can I tell you, it'd be really cool if we as a church would begin to do things the way He wanted us to do it. Because here we can sit here and say, well, I I, I just can't figure it out. I I can't figure out what we're going to do next. Well, guess what? You're not supposed to. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your what? Heart. With everything that you are. Every ounce of being. Trust God. And the reason that we can trust God is because He knows what He's doing. He knows what, what He's doing. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He shall direct your paths. Wherein you don't know what to do next, He does. When you can't figure it all out, He's already got it figured out. Because we go through our lives thinking we've got it. We go through there and folks, we can even fool ourselves. We can fool ourselves. Because we don't have it all figured out. I I even shared in in the first service this morning, I said, you know, one of my biggest fears is everybody here at First Baptist West, one day you're going to wake up and realize I don't have a clue what I'm doing. Amen. I worry about that every day. One day, y'all going to wake up and go, boy, that guy doesn't have a clue. I don't. I don't, I don't know how I'm doing. What I, I don't know the answer to these things. Man, but I, I try every day to go with all of my heart and seek what God wants. So it's not our head. We can try, and sometimes we talk ourselves out of doing things that God wants us to do. Amen? 
Because we can't figure it out. We don't know how it's going to work. So if we, you and I sit in our meetings and we can't figure out how it's going to work, you know what we do? Say, well, I guess it's not going to happen today. Because I can't figure it out. Listen, if God leads us to do it, the fact is we ought to go ahead and do it because He's got it figured out. And if we don't know how to do it, ask Him. And the Bible says that He will then give us wisdom in an abundance to do the things that He wants us to do. If you and I can't figure it out, He can. He already has it, so it can't be with our head. It has to be our heart. But not only our heart, but it, can't, it has to be not our body. It can't be our body. We can't depend on our power or our might. What I can do with my own abilities. What I have the power to do. God's work cannot be accomplished by our physical prowess. Amen? We don't have the strength to do all that God wants us to do. We don't have the strength to do what we want to do. Do you realize without God working in us, we don't have the strength to even get up in the morning? It's only by Him. But we look in, in the word of Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6, and it says this. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, nor by power. Now what he's saying here is you're not going to be able to fight this battle not by your power and not by your might. So that's what he's trying to say. Not by power or might. What he's saying is not by yours. Not by your power, not by your might. But, here's the good stuff. Not by what you can do. Not what you have the power and strength to do. But by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. By my power. The power that created all the universe with the spoken word. That power is now on our side. Amen? That what I don't have the strength to do, He does. What I don't have the intellect to figure out, He does. And so He says now, greater is He that is in me than he that is in this world. Folks, I don't have to have the strength to do it. I have to call on Him to give me that strength. You have to call on Him to give you that strength. First Baptist West has to call on God to give us this strength to make it through whatever you have for us. But not by our power, not by our might. And again, here's where we get into trouble. Because we say we don't have enough, and we name stuff, to do what we feel God's wanting us to do. We don't have enough. We don't have enough money. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough whatever it is. And so what we do then is we say, well, we don't have enough power. We don't have enough might. So what we're going to do is we're just going to stand here. And he says, not by your power, not by your might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So it's not by our head, our intellect, it's not by our body or our power, but it's not even by our talent. It's not by what we can offer. It's not how good we are at doing whatever it is we're supposed to do. And we realize that sometimes we do it on our own talent and our own ability. Folks, listen, we can't rely on ourselves. We can't rely on us to do it. God is the one who provides what we have and He receives the glory. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 10. It says, Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Now, verse 11, I want to go ahead and add on to this. It says, If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, he should do so with the strength that God provides so that all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So He says, it's not your talent, but it's His working through you. That the very words we speak should not be our words, they're His. I don't have the speaking ability to get God's Word across to people. Amen? I'm not that good, but He is. So it's not my talent standing up here preaching because if it's my talent that I'm depending on, folks, you are in big, big trouble. I can't speak these words well enough so that God can speak to you. It has to be Him doing it through me. But so often we sit back and say, well, I can't. And we lay out whatever it is that we can't do to do what God wants us to do. So we said, well, I, I don't have that ability. I don't have that skill. I don't have that whatever and so we end up, what do we do? We step back and we wait. We let God down. Let Him 
not tell us what to do anymore because basically we don't have the talent to do it. Now listen, I want, I want to share this with you though before I move on. I want you to understand the head, the intellect, the power and might and the ability that God has given us, those will be used of course. They will be eventually used. But they are a byproduct of the heart. That we don't use our head, our intellect, our body, our power, our talent, or our ability. We don't use those first. That if I'm doing it with passion, it's going to be Him doing it. His work through us. So the heart is the center. And folks, can I tell you this? If the heart is the center, then the scripture that tells us to guard our hearts becomes very important. I think a lot of times we think this guarding our heart is only those who we fall in love with. But we need to guard our heart with everything that we're doing. Because if I'm supposed to do everything with my heart, then I better guard that heart. I better make sure that it's freshened in the Spirit of God on a daily basis. There's a law of entropy which says, with, ev with the passing of time, everything inevitably enters into a process of deterioration. That eventually, if things are left undone, it will begin to decay. That you must continually work it and keep it up. You look at your house, you look, look, look at your body, everything. Left alone, it will begin to deteriorate. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us, and Paul says, this old outer body decays. Amen? But the Spirit can be renewed how often? Daily. That spirit can be renewed daily. Folks, I, I, I've told you now for almost every sermon for nine years how important it is for you to have a personal time with God on a regular daily basis. Why? So that you can daily guard your heart, that you can daily be refreshed, so that you can daily be re relying on Him to give you what you want, so that you can daily go out and serve Him with passion. Serve Him with passion, not your intellect, not your strength, and not your ability. So we see that that's one way we know. The second way that we know is that we do it in season and out of season. When we do it, when it's right and easy and natural, then when we do it when it's not so natural, when it becomes difficult, the Bible tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 2, chapter 4, I'm sorry, verse 2 says, Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. In other words, do it when it's natural, do it when it's easy, but also be ready to do it at all times. He says, Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Be there, be consistent. So that's what the idea is it's consistency. It's even during the COVID. Amen? Do you realize that First Baptist West has been called to continue to serve with passion, to worship with passion, to live with passion, even during the COVID times? We're called to do that. We can't turn it off. We can't step back and say, man, when all of this is over, man, we are going to go full speed ahead. Can I tell you, None of us in here knows when this is going to be over. Amen? We don't know this. So we can't sit back and say, well, you know, preacher, we're just going to take it easy now, and then when it comes time, man, we're going to turn it on. And when we turn it on, we're going to go like bank gangbusters, and we're going to see people's lives be changed. Can I tell you something? The Bible says that's not the way you do the ministry. That's not doing it with passion. Because you shouldn't turn it on and turn it off. You should turn it on all the time. In season, out of season. But we sometimes fool ourselves, think we can do it. I, I want to tell you another story real quick. I hope I don't bore you with my stories. But y'all know that, again, that for 17 years, I was a girls basketball coach in the school systems. I was very blessed to have won a lot of ball games, won a lot of tournaments and different things. All not because of me, I promise you. God somehow saw fit to bless me a lot of times with some very good lady athletes. Man, they could they could get on it. 
I remember one game in, in particular that I learned a valuable lesson about turning things on and turning them off and trying to turn them back on again. There was one ball game that we were playing, and I remember where it was in Drumright, Oklahoma. Many, anybody know where Drumright, Oklahoma is? It's in the northeastern part of the state, kind of uh, east of Stillwater. Y'all might know where that is. Y'all know where Stillwater is, right? Some of y'all know. <laughs> I don't know where it is, but y'all might. No, <laughs> anyway. But it's east of Stillwater with several miles, and we were up there, and man, we, we were playing, and boy, my girls were just busting it at the seams, and man, we were winning. We were up by 20, 25 points, and uh, we got into halftime, and I, I, you know, and I thought, okay, well, that's pretty good. I'll bring my starters out. We'll play just a few minutes, and then I'm going to turn it over. I, I don't want to, because one of the things I never want to do is beat a team really badly. I didn't want to make another team look bad. So I said to myself, self, you're doing well. Playing for a few minutes, and then after the few minutes, you're going to pull your starters, and you're going to put in the reserves, and you're just going to play the rest of the game like that. You, you pretty well should have it. Well, guess what? We didn't have it. We go through the rest of the third quarter, and for whatever reason, my, he kept his starters in, and man, they were present. They were coming back, and they at the end of the third quarter, we were only up by about 12. We'd already lost a, a 25-point lead down to a 12-point lead, and I thought, well, you know, I, I think we're going to be all right. I want to play us a little bit longer, and if worse comes to worse, I'm going to turn it on. I'll put my starters back in. We'll bust it. We'll press. We'll, good, we'll show them how good we really are. Well, <clears throat> we get about two minutes into the fourth quarter, and now they've knocked it down to about five points. And my, the, the, what was funny is the boys' coach down on the end was over look, give me, he, he'd sit during my games, he'd sit on the end of the bench, and he was looking at me going, like, hey, stupid, what are you doing? You better, he, and he was kind of doing this, get him back in. I said, I think so. So I get him in, I'm ready to say, okay, we turn it off, but we are so good, that now it's panic time. We're going to turn it on. Boy, was I wrong. I put my starters back out there. They hadn't played and they hadn't done anything in a quarter, almost a quarter and a half now. I could have told them to grab a basketball right here and hit at that screen and they'd have hit the wall over here. That's how bad we were shooting. We were mishandling the ball. We could. We were making bad passes. Our defense was sluggish. And folks, that got that team got to within one point. I call a timeout and I bring them over and I said, "Girls, you got to do something for me. I have never asked in all the years that I've been coaching. I've never asked a team to do this for me. But girls, ladies, I'm going to ask you to pull my tail out of this fire because I just messed up big time." And I really need you to somehow reach deep down inside and get it together and do what we know we can do. And let's win, win this game. Please win it for me because I'm going to look like a fool. Praise God. These girls were able to go do that. We got back out and we did manage just like things changed a little bit. We ended up winning by about six points. And I'm telling you, I learned a valuable lesson that day. I better be in season and out of season, ready at all times. Folks, you can't turn things on and turn it off because here's the thing that I found out. You may turn it off for a while thinking you're able to turn it back on when the time comes, but when the time comes, you may not be able to turn it on again. But also not only that, folks, listen, in the church, you may want to turn things off and turn it back on, but when you turn it back on, there may not be anything left to turn on because you've let it go so long. You've allowed your ministry to dwindle. We've allowed our church to sit back so long that there's nothing left. So he says, you know you're doing it with all your passion, doing it with all of your heart. When you are consistently doing it, regardless when it's good or when it's bad, when it's easy or when it's hard, when it's clear of COVID or when COVID is going on, we still need to be ministering to people. And the last one, and I'll close up with this. The last one is we'll know we're doing it with heart when we know who this is for. When we begin to realize the reason we're even doing this. Folks, can I tell you, we're not doing this for us. 
When I talk about ministry, when I talk about serving, when I talk about doing it with passion, I'm not talking about for us, doing it for us. I'm not asking you to do it for me. What we need to understand is we're doing it for Christ. He says here, and whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord. Everything you're doing, you're not doing it for, for the church, you're doing it for the Lord. He says in verse 24, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. You serve the Lord Christ. That's why we do what we do. We serve, it, we serve Jesus. The Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5.14 says, For the love of Christ compels us. In other words, it's the love of Christ that is working in me. It's love that He has shown me through the crucifixion, through the salvation that He's given me, through the guidance, through the strength, through the encouragement. It's that love that now is working through me that compels me, urges me, pushes me into serving with all of my heart. But it's not only the love that He's shown me, it's the love that I have for Him. Because I love Him, because of what He's done for me, I, I will serve Him with all of my heart. I don't want to coast anymore. I don't want to just go through the motions anymore. I want to do everything for Him because He loves me. He's the one that died for me and I want to show Him that love. But not only do we do that, we do it for the lost and hurting. We do it for the lost and the hurting. My friends, can I tell you, as I shared last week, there's a lot of lost people that need Jesus. A lot of lost people that need Jesus. But can I also tell you this? There's a lot of hurting people. As a matter of fact, there's a lot of hurting people in this church that need us to minister to them. There's some that may be watching today that are hurting. There's some of you sitting right here that you may be hurting and we need to understand that that's why we do it. We do it with a passion to bring people to Jesus. We do it with a passion to help people who are hurting and in great need. And my friends, listen to me. Jesus is coming again. And Jesus is coming again soon. I believe that we don't have a lot of time. And we must do it with a sense of urgency. We can't sit back keeping it turned off, waiting for a time, because this COVID may not be over when Jesus comes. And if He comes, do not let Him see us sitting back. Do not let Him see us lean back and sleeping like we know the story of the ten virgins. Five had oil, five did not. And man, this story just, just blows my mind. The five that had the oil, the five that didn't have the oil. And one thing that the Bible says that when He came, the Master came, the Bridegroom came, they were all sleeping. The five that were prepared were sleeping. The five that weren't prepared were sleeping. And my heart breaks over that. You know why? Because the five that were prepared should have never gone to sleep. Because they should have looked over there and saw five that weren't ready. And they should have been encouraging, compelling, begging, doing whatever they can to get those five prepared. But the Bible says they were all sleeping my friends I want to close with this thought again Jesus could come back any moment my heart and my prayer is that he would not come back and find me asleep when there were people out there who needed to be warned he would not find me turning the switch off because it's a tough time out there you know turn the switch off because those people are still in need out there. There's people in our church that are hurting physically, emotionally, spiritually. Do not let me be found asleep, God, when you come back. Do not let my church be found asleep, God, when you come back. Do not let us be turning the switch off, waiting for the coast to clear, waiting for us to get on fire again, waiting for us to be able to step up and do what we were supposed to be doing all along. Please, God, don't let us be caught asleep. Let us be the church that's calling out to people, helping people, encouraging people, meeting people's needs, showing them Jesus, doing it with all our heart. My friend, that's how we're going to know. If the heart is at the center, 
we're doing it with passion. If we're doing it in season and out of season, we're doing it with passion. If we know who we're doing it for, that it's for Jesus and His glory to reach people for, for Him and to help meet the needs of those around us, we'll know that we're doing it with a passion. But don't let us lie to ourselves. Let us not deceive ourselves. Let everything that you do be done with all your heart. Let it be done with all your heart. I'd like everybody to bow your head as we step into this time. Carrie and Patrick are going to come and they're going to, lead, uh, they're going to sing a song over us here today. And that song is going to be spoken to you as an encouragement. And here's what I want you to do. That if you're here, if you're at home, I want you to just meditate on, on the song that she's singing, on the words that she's going to be declaring to us. And if you're here or you're at home and you don't know Jesus as your Savior, that before this song is over, that you will call out to God and say, God, I know I need you. God, forgive me of my sins. God, I, I so desperately want to be healed. And God, I surrender my life to you today. If you need some help, man, you could just call our church. Call our church right now. There's somebody listening. There's somebody ready to visit with you. 536-4227. Man, you call that number. Someone will answer. Someone will pray over you. Someone will guide you. If you're here, I'll be down front. Man, I, I want to pray with you. I want you to receive Jesus in your life. But maybe you're here and maybe you're at home and you say, Pastor, I've lost that passion. If you're talking about these things, that passion hasn't been there. And I want to serve with the passion again. Man, just surrender yourself over to Him. Surrender yourself back to Him. Call out, God, restore back to me the joy of Your salvation. God, that I could be renewed, my spirit could be renewed. That, God, I could begin to serve You with passion. Serve You at my work. Serve You at school. Serve You whenever I go out and do whatever it is I do. God, I want to do it with all my heart. God, I don't want to be caught asleep anymore. God, stir up my spirit. Wake me up, God. Wake me up. Would you listen to this song? And if God's speaking to your heart, call or come forward. We'll be down front. We'll be listening. As Carrie leads and sings to you right now.